Yep, all coffeeed up. Fantastic. Okay, so as I'm sure you've noticed, I really don't take so well to your mobile phone making sounds, so if you don't mind turning it down or turning it off, that would be really, really good. What I don't have a problem with is people singing out any time they want to ask me a question, so you should feel free. Also, um, there is a slide, key, uh, a slide. There is a key kicking out with the slides on it at the moment. But if you'd rather grab them from uh, from the network, you can certainly attempt to do that. They're right there on the homepage of my website right now. There's not a huge amount in the slides that you don't badly need, although I do find um, certainly for myself, I like following along with the slides on my own screen. So if that's you, great. <coughs> I've got that address. Does anyone want some time to get the slides? No, not there. That's good. Great. So, um, my name's Ray, and here obviously is where we're going to be talking about usability testing. If you're here for the car thing, you're in the wrong room. <laughs> I'm actually a bit jealous because I really wanted to see the car, and they put me up against the car talk, and I'm like, you buggers. And what we're going to be talking about is usability testing. And I'm calling this champagne usability testing on a beer budget. And the reason why I'm doing that is because, well, one, obviously I'm a big fan of beer budgets. I don't like spending quite too much on my biz. Also because a lot of people seem to have the misconception that to get absolutely qualitatively fantastic usability testing, you absolutely positively have to have a lab full of scientists with coats and big racks of monitors and God knows what else. That's great. And yes, you do get fantastic results from that. But you don't have to exclude yourself from usability testing just because you don't have those sorts of resources, yeah? Great. Now, I'm from a training background, by the way, so if I tend to sort of go, I'm not ready to move on yet, it's out of habit, so I'm very sorry. So what we're going to talk about basically, first of all, what is usability about? That's a really important thing. If you're absolutely new to the idea of usability at all, then we will talk about that a little bit. Uh, but obviously this talk is more about the actual testing side of things, so um, we're going to be speaking more about that. Uh, we're going to be talking about the method of testing. We're going to think about sort of tasks we can get people to do so we can see what they're doing. Uh, we're going to find out some interesting things um, about how users actually use the product that we're thinking about. Uh, and then, of course, I'm going to give you a few links to read up on later. So, show of hands time. How many of you guys um, are developers of... Graphical applications, you know, GTK, etc. Yep. How about web developers? Lots more of you. Fantastic. How many of you have done usability testing before, formally or informally? Oh, that's good. That's a few. A, a few of those. <laughs> and so I guess the rest of you haven't done it at all. Oh, brilliant. Okie doke. So hopefully we'll learn a few interesting sorts of things. Is it something that those of you who have done it before, is it something you feel confident about or are you just here to see if I cock it up? I saw that. Least are honest. The goal of usability testing, what would any of you suggest it is? Feel free to sing out. Must the questions be in verse? Sorry? Must the questions be in verse? Uh, they can be in verse if you I'll accept haiku in a pinch. <laughs> okay, the, the goal should be fairly straightforward. Oh, okay. To allow the user to get shit done. Quincy March, yes. To allow the user to get shit done. I'm a big fan of the word shit. I'm very sorry if you're offended by that. Um, basically, we want to make sure that people get things done, but also what we're after is making sure they get it done in the most pleasurable and usable and interesting manner. There are three goals about usability that I like to talk about. Um, there are a lot of people that try to define usability in a lot of different ways, but basically it boils down to these three massive points. Is it easy to use? Is the interface nice and clear? Can people get around what they're doing without having to guess? Or mm, maybe I should click on that thing. Oh, I missed it because it's too close to each other or what have you. Can, sorry, can everyone hear me okay? I'm not used to this microphone. Yep. Can you hear me better? Not really. <laughs> okay. We're also interested in efficiency. So is the user getting things done in the most efficient manner, or are we making them sit around for 45 minutes to configure something that would ordinarily take five if you had tried a little harder? We're thinking about satisfaction as well. So more importantly, are people going to want to use our application or our website again? Are they going to be um, choosing it over some other application that is, you know, does the same sort of thing, but maybe it's not as good, but maybe they just prefer the interface? We don't want that. More importantly, will the user recommend it to their friends? We do rely so much on word of mouth in the open source community, so this is a really big thing. Making sense? 
Fantastic. You often hear a lot of people talking about usability in terms of can my grandma use it? Or my personal pet peeve, can my girlfriend use it? Okay, of course, it's a really good goal to have absolutely newbie people being able to use it and have, you know, very clear interface and what have you. And it would be really, really nice to have grandma doing those things. If there's nothing else that you take home from this, today, it's this thing. Please, please, please stop thinking about usability as a grandma problem. And if I ever catch any of you saying it's a girlfriend problem, I will personally come to your house and kick your butt. Sorry? <laughs> Is that an offer? The reason why that's such a problem is because a lot of people will characterise the whole usability thing as something that, you know, there's, there's people like us who are coming to this conference and, you know, we're all fairly technical and, you know, there's some that are obviously more technical than others and that's great. They'll characterise the whole usability thing as, oh, you know, grandma and Linux on the desktop and blah, blah, blah. Um, it really is important for everybody. It's not just that. So it can be really patronising to have this particular discipline being characterised as something that's not so good. The other thing as well is that someone's grandma might be a kernel hacker for all you know. So, you know, mind the grandma. Now, from usability testing, obviously, I'm not going to talk about, you know, um, principles of good development. What, did anyone go to um, Mr. Coey's paper talk yesterday about usability? I went to about half of it because I also wanted to see some Inkscape goodness. It was pretty good. Um, providing that you've, you know, tried very hard to make sure that your um, interface is very nice. What we want to find out is, is this part of my app or my whole app easy to use? Is this new feature easy for new users to learn? Is this the most efficient use of the time and do they enjoy using it? So those three goals that we were talking about before can line up to those. But also if, you, if you're you know, working on a project that's a little older, is this an improvement on the last version? Um, maybe I'm trying out a different version of the interface and I'd like to see if it's better. Um, does my app do a better job at such and such than some other product? Make sense? Good. I what we don't want to do, we don't want to test for bugs. Usability testing is not about testing for bugs, that is what bug testing is for. We're not necessarily checking for performance either. Again, we already have lots and lots of tools to do that, which is great. We don't use it to decide what to document. Did anyone go to the documentation? Has that even happened, the documentation talk? I think I missed it. We're not using usability testing to decide what to document, okay? It's not finding holes in how easy things are to use so that uh, we can write documentation about the stuff that's hard because we couldn't be bothered fixing it. That's a bit rude. Um, of course, you can use that as good feedback to decide how to document it. Um, it's also not really about ensuring you stuck to the guidelines. The guidelines for whatever environment you're using or you know, if, you do, if you're a GTK application developer or what have you, um, the guidelines are right there. They're fairly clean cut. It's just a matter of finding out whether or not you're doing it in the most usable manner. <coughs> Make sense? Gosh, you guys are all fairly quiet. It's freaking me out. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now, a lot of people think um, when they first approach the idea of usability testing, they're thinking, great, I've written this app, I've finalised it, I'm ready to ship it. Oh, maybe I should test it out and see how that goes. Probably not the best idea. What you want to do is start testing as soon as you have something solid for people to look at. So when should I start testing? Preferably right away. As soon as you have something that people can start using, test it out now so that you don't dig yourself into a big hole later. Of course, if you didn't have the time to do that or you didn't have the, the way they what have you, you should feel free to do it later as well. I'm just saying that the earlier you can get it in, the more problems you can pick up before you get to your final product, yeah? Make sense? I mean, you wouldn't wait to bug test at the end of a build, would you? No. So was that a question or a smart aleck comment? Outstanding. <laughs> now, formal usability testing um, is something that's... Sorry? That's okay. I like actually hearing what you guys are saying. It's all right. You don't have to keep your voice down. You can feel free to heckle. Ah, uh, yes. That's very nice. Is anyone actually out there? Hello? Yeah. 
Now, formal usability testing is something that um, if you've spent much time thinking about usability testing, and certainly, is, has anyone been to one of um, Jacob Nielsen's talks that cost about five digits? Anyone? No, I, I haven't got that kind of cash. Um, I could have snuck in the back. That would have been pretty good. Yep, that was pretty good. <laughs> Um, and don't cost five digits, which is fantastic. But if you're thinking about formal usability testing, it's something that you ordinarily set up a lot of equipment for and you make it extremely scientifically rigorous. So we're talking about, you know, so I actually don't have anything on the monitoring side here to actually look at my notes. So we're talking about, you know, a lab. And the university, um, I believe, had a lab at some point, although I'm not sure. But certainly at the State Library of Tasmania, if, uh, if you're a bit of a dork about these sorts of things and you feel like asking them, they do have a usability testing lab sitting downstairs. And it's got, you know, the whole two mirrors and the computers with the monitors and the video camera set up to look at people. And if you've ever been there to do a test or if you've ever done it, has anyone actually been a participant in a usability test? Uh, sorry? And run them? Fantastic. You've done them for me, yeah? That's right, you do have a magic number of five, which we'll talk about. Um, a lot of people, they think that you do need to test with a lot of people so that you can say, well, exactly 73% of users had problem with my widget, which is not necessarily what we want to have. Um, you do need to, um, if you are doing a fairly formal sort of test, is try and keep it quite rigorous and not have you. Um, you do need to plan ahead. And, of course, if you do have to um, acquire that sort of equipment yourself or if you need to rent one, sometimes it can cost you a bit of cash. Uh, which is not necessarily all that good. What we're going to be talking about, though, is peer budget usability testing, which is a lot more accessible to a lot of us. Um, peer budget usability testing is pretty much something that you can do anywhere um, without too much equipment. You just need to grab yourself a PC and a couple of willing participants. Um, you can make it quite a lot more casual. You don't have to be pointing cameras in people's faces, and that can be really confronting to a lot of people. Um, it's really, really easy to plan and organise, certainly relative to booking out a whole lab. And, of course, it's somewhat cheaper to do that, yeah? Does that sound a bit more purely? Thought so. Now, there are obviously quite a few uh, goals that we wanted to achieve, so what's easiest to do, but also there are some tasks that we'd like people to f perform to, uh, to show us, basically, how they're using that application. So thinking about the goals that you're interested in, you can then match up some tasks that you might want to get them to do. So if you're thinking, well, I want to see whether or not somebody can use my, um, my database and I've made this sexy little red interface for it and what have you, you might want to make sure um, whether or not they can, you know, do a query or what have you or look up some information or something. Um, again, if you're doing something like an email program, you want to make sure that tasks that relate to email. So rather than just saying, can you open it and save a document, you'll be actually wanting them to send an email or something similar. You might want to pick one or two slightly more complex tasks. Let's take a look at some of the tasks. Now, solid real tasks that you give people are a lot easier to do than, uh, than tasks that are a little bit vague. So what you might want to think about is in terms of plain English sort of sentences to describe the kind of task and goal that you're after. So you might say, you'd like to write a quick letter, do this, make a new thing, write the letter, save it, print it off, or do whatever it is that you need to do. Or again, you might like to make a music CD, so you need to go and pick out some tracks and arrange it and burn it up and maybe put a cover on it and things like that. These are, sorry? Sorry, question. Um, I look at those plain English scenarios and they actually sound like the sequence of buttons that the rest of the computer press. They could sound like a sequence of buttons to press, yeah. Uh-huh. You don't want to point them out and say, make a new document by selecting it from the file when you're going to new. That's probably too far. Sorry, did anyone not catch the question? The question was, do you want to um, Im imply the actual steps involved in the task? And the answer is no, obviously you don't, because if you're leading them on, you're not going to get a very good result um, about how well usable it is. You're basically telling them how to do it. So, yeah, now you wouldn't want to actually say, too explicitly to do that. It's not really like a cryptic crossword sort of thing that you need to do with these tasks though. It's just basically you're just trying to formulate some, some fairly common tasks that you'd like people to be successful at when using your app. Does that make sense? Sort of? Do you think it needs to be a bit more cryptic? It's okay if you do. Yep. Exactly. 
Yeah, I find that when you're thinking about um, tasks that you'd like to do, now normally these are the sort of tasks that I would, um, when conducting a test, tell somebody in this order, in those words. At this point, when you're just thinking about tasks, you don't have to. But obviously, you're thinking of a goal, so is this easy to do? Then you can think about some of the things that you might want to do with that. Yeah. Basically, yeah, that's right. So um, for anyone who didn't catch all of that, the basic nuts and bolts were how the base you want to be comes down to what it is you're testing. Was that your hand? Yeah. Yep. Um, as in smarter people, not so much. Yep. Yep. No, that's right. Yep, yep. So for anyone who didn't hear all of that, yeah, the floor and ceiling effect in terms of um, difficult versus easy questions. And if you have too many of one or the other, then you're not going to get some fantastic results. That's right. Yep. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of it comes down to habit. You'll still see quite a lot of people who, um, despite the fact that they know lots of keyboard shortcuts for everybody else or everything else, will still use the edit menu to select all, as an example. Or you might even see people who will get their cursor and drag it all the way down to the bottom of the text to select all. And it's just a habit thing sometimes, yeah. Um, and, yeah, just leading off from that, yep. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. You don't want results that um, are really skewed towards things that are too easy or things that are too hard. It's important if you're organising these sorts of questions to, to try and cover as much as you can. If the thing is though, if your application is fairly overall very easy and it doesn't do a lot of complex stuff, it can be hard to feel like you're being scientifically more correct that way. But if it's getting the job done for you, then that's what you'd like to do. But yeah, just to recap, we've got these things. What we're going to do is we're going to ask people to do a task. We're going to tell them what the goal is so they don't feel like they're just sort of wandering along picking up clues like it's the great, um, the amazing race or something. We actually want to tell them what their end result is. So we're thinking of tasks that are like that and things that people would actually do. The other thing that we need to do, so we've thought of tasks, we've thought of some goals, we've thought of some tasks, is to think about some test subjects. Now again, you can be quite rigorous about doing this, but again, we're talking about the whole beer budget situation. So what we're interested in doing simply is this. We want to choose people who, first of all, are actually likely to use the app. You don't want to get somebody testing out GIMP who is very unlikely to ever make graphics for any reason in their life ever as an example. You probably do want to choose some people who are reasonably new to it if it's the sort of app that you would expect them to want to use. It can be really, really good as a fresh sort of thing, but again, you might have a bit of a situation where if they are totally new to some topic um, and they've only just figured out what the right mouse button is for, you might be getting a bit of a situation where they're overly frustrated with the task or, or not quite right. Um, if you're interested, obviously, in testing out whether or not your app is better or whether your website even is better than the one that uh, you were having the public use before, then obviously you might want to pick some people who have actually used it because they might be able to give you some interesting feedback on uh, how they feel about the new version versus the old version and so on. Does that make sense? You're right for plug. Good eh? Please do try not to choose other developers from your project. You're all too close to your own projects in order to get this right. It can be so hard to step back. So, so hard. And I know this myself. I mean, I've worked on a number of websites where I've thought that something was perfectly useful and then someone else will come along and say, what is that? I don't even understand what this is for. It can be really, really hard to do that. So some extra perspective from people who are just not involved with the project at all is really ideal. You may be a little bit stuck for people that you need to ask, certainly if what you're working on is a bit secret school, but uh, hopefully that's okay. 
it's never a bad idea when you're just grabbing randoms from, you know, if you're at uni or something like that, you just want to grab some folks to look at something, is offer them a nice incentive like a coffee voucher or, you know, order some pizzas or get some little goodie bags together or something like that. Never a bad idea because obviously people feel like they've got something out of it. You probably only want to pick, and, and again, as we've heard, there's the magic number of five. You can pick up the vastest majority of your usability issues with just five people. You can obviously pick a few more if you like. But out of those first five you test, you will get the most meat out of it. Make sense? Now I'm sure we all know five people we can ask to play with something, yeah? Does anyone not? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. If you're picking five, so for anyone who didn't hear all that, you want to make sure that out of your five or so people that you pick, you've got a good spread of abilities and backgrounds and what have you. Because again, if you do have five people from a typing pool, for anyone who didn't hear that, they're going to come from that in terms of, of that sort of background and that sort of goal in mind. So you don't necessarily want to have that kind of thing going on. Well, if there are applications for people in the typing pool, yeah. But then again, you can think about your target market, so to speak, and then think of a spread that might be in there. So you might have people who um, maybe do a lot of transcription, and then maybe some people that only type letters or something, for example, because again, they have different goals of their own. Or that have been with the company one year or five years. Yep, one year, five years, long time in the typing pool, yes. Yeah, any software they might have used previously, if it's not your product or something like that as well. So you can still look at some, a bit of a spread in terms of that there. Um, it's a little difficult to, um, again, when you do have such a tightly focused thing, to find a huge spread of that. But if you can ascertain what sort of background they're coming from uh, when you talk to them, that's usually a good thing. Does that make sense? Do you have anything to add? Oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, you might not want to get, at least for some of your spread, you want, might want to get people who work, have worked with competitive applications before. Yep. Um, in that case, they do pay people their time. It's really just work with them. You know. Yep, paying people their time, of course, is really lovely, but this is the beer budget. <laughs> this is the beer budget. You can buy them in beer. In fact, I had someone approach me at lunchtime going, will there be beer? <laughs> I'm sorry, there's no beer. Yes. Instrumentation as in things that I want to measure with, or...? Um, the, for instance, if we did, I believe you can get it and open office, you can get a uh, Google Sheet and you can get an instrument version where the application records mm -hmm. every action that you have taken. Yep. And you can then see both uh, the timing and the... Sort of plays, plays it back and stuff. And you can also start aggregating that. Um, yep. So Yeah. It's not something ordinarily I would suggest to, again, thinking of the beer budget. So we're talking about, you know, a couple of dudes in their bedroom doing whatever, um, or girls, of course. But, um, but yeah, of course, if you do have the time and the, um, and the inclination to build that sort of thing in, I'm quite sure there's a few good frameworks that are already available to just capture clicks and type uh, and things. Yes. Yeah, it's phenomenally easy for the web to do this, that's right. Um, click heat. Click heat. Sucks for some layouts. That's probably true. Yeah. There's, there's quite a lot of good stuff that you can get out of things like that. Yeah, if you do feel like building in some instrumentation to your app, that's great. Again, thinking about the beer budget thing, if you haven't had time and you just want to get people to try it out and you don't have time to put that in, that's okay too. If you have the resources, that's fantastic. Yes? Yes, it is. In fact, we're going to talk about recording um, in a later slide, but um, just things like um, GTK record on desktop or um, VNC to SWF and whatnot, you can actually see what people are doing. Oh my god, silverback.app, says Pascal. Um, if you are using a Mac, then Silverback is great. 
um, and is um, worthy, worthy, let me tell you. So it's quite good. Recording. Obviously, recording things is quite handy. You don't need to record if you don't feel that you do. If really all you're looking for is an idea of whether or not people are feeling angsty or upset, you will get better results, of course, if you do. Um, and it is quite easy to record things that way. I really like this dog. <laughs> I'd never own one, but oh my god. So maybe, of course, you do want to take your notes later. It's always a good idea whilst you're um, conducting the test, but we haven't got to conducting the test yet. Um, maybe you'd like to take some notes. Now, we've got a couple of things in there. I've got a little question mark next to Istanbul because I was fiddling with it and it was doing this very strange thing where it would only redraw the portion of the screen that had my mouse on it and then it would black out a bunch of other stuff and what have you. There are lots and lots of interesting tools that you can just apt get to your little heart's content. Um, record my desktop is quite cool. Um, VMC to SWF and so on. Now, some people like to get super clever and what they'll do is they will get the webcam window happening and they'll pop it in the corner of the screen and then they will also so be VMCing from another machine and what have you. If you don't have other machines to do that, that's fine. Um, but they all do pretty much the same thing, which is record what's going on. They can also have the ability to record the sound at the same time coming from the internal microphone. Make sense? Yep, all that good stuff. Now, of course, you might want to share your tests with somebody else, so it's a really good thing to be able to do that. If you're there and observing it, you can see all those great things, but if you're talking to one of your contributors who's halfway around the globe and you say, yeah, they seem pretty peeved with it, and this other person across the country, well, maybe they won't necessarily believe you until they actually see and hear what's going on and hear somebody going, oh, geez, I don't know how to do this. So, of course, recording it is really quite handy. Once you've got all your ducks in a row as regards that, it's time to think about actually conducting your tests. So you've got your people, you've got your goals and tasks, you've thought about all those great things. The next thing you'll want to do is think about setting up the room. If you are providing that you're even doing it in a room, and of course this again being the beer budget, you can do it in a quiet bar if you prefer, if you've got a laptop. Not that I've ever done any work in a bar. Make sure that it's relatively free of distractions. If it's really noisy and people are carrying on and there are lots of people going past and brushing past you and all the rest of it, it can be really quite distracting. Uh, so a busy sort of university room like this is probably not the best. Try and use fairly standard equipment. Gosh, those XOs are very, very cute. No, their chiclet keyboards are not conducive to normal typing action. I think they're great, but if they're not used to it, don't do that. So try and use a fairly standard sort of bunch of equipment. Yeah, you know, honking great gamer mouse with 25 buttons as well is probably not the best one to use. Um, it's always polite to provide snacks and drinks and beer. If you feel like offering beer, that's cool too. Um, offering snacks and drinks is a very good thing, especially if people have, you know, they've just got off their bike and, you know, they've come down to test out your awesome app and they're really hot and tired and just give them a nice glass of water or something. Um, provide some notepaper for yourself. Another great thing to do is print your tasks on a bit of paper, cut them up into little strips, and then you can hand them to them. So when you've thought about your tasks, like you'd like to make a CD, go and pick out some tracks, burn them on, print off a cover or something, you can hand it to them on a bit of paper, and then that way, after you've spoken to them, they can refer back to the bit of paper if they've forgotten what else it is that you needed them to do. Make sense? Fantastic. Any questions? Hello, or comments? Um, yeah, I just thought, um, uh, you've got to be careful when you're doing stuff that's uh, specifically an application that you're working on is designed to only work on one operating system or one setup. So, for example, if you're doing something, you're going on something, you're going to 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 something, you are going to something you Yeah, that's absolutely right. So yeah, um, again, to add to our standard equipment thing, um, as Pascal just said, is to make sure that you're actually using the platform that you intend people to use it on. Um, there is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Firefox is fairly straightforward no matter what platform you're on, that's right. Um, so yeah, if it were an application, then obviously you want to test with people who are familiar with it. Up the back. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Record My Desktop does not show clicks, that's right. There are quite a few things that will show you clicks. Um, one really obvious one is that you can actually set up, um, I assume in Caddy as well, but at least in Gnome, to, uh, to have a little pulse, a little circular thing whenever somebody presses control. I'm sure there's some sneaky way you can get it to do that whenever somebody clicks. No, of course, you can't record click things. The thing is, if it's a very clicky sort of application or a clicky website or something like that, you can usually tell when somebody's clicked. Now, the other thing as well, which we'll talk about when we talk about actually conducting the test, is to say to people um, when you're going through it, to say, well, why don't you just talk me through what you're doing? So you'll, you'll, if you're um, conducting a test, you might often get some, um, some recordings of people going, oh, I'm going to have a look in the file menu, click. And they don't say click, obviously, but as they're clicking, you can, you can fairly easily match up what they're doing with... Yep, yep, you can do those interesting things. Um, again, if you've got the, the built-in doodahs with applications and stuff, if you're taking the time to build them in, they usually record clicks as well. Um, if it's just a video, though, yeah, you can you, you pretty much have to guess. Make sense? Anyone else have anything interesting to add? I can see there's like three people lurking at the top. Hello. So if you wanted to ask questions, I'll ignore you. I keep forgetting that you're there. Of course, you do want to set up the machine in a sensible way as well. So you clearly want to install a stable version both of your operating system and of the app, if it's an app, um, or at least you know a tidy version of, uh, of Firefox or what have you if you're testing the website. Um, you want to make sure that the desktop is nice and tidy. What I like to do if I'm showing anybody anything in a presentation for any reason at all is make them a user account because then you can't see all these odd things in my uh, browser history or what have you as well, which is always not fun. So uh, get, any user account is usually what I like to do. Um, it's a really great idea to turn off anything else that you might be tempted to leave on. I know that uh, certainly in, uh, in other OSs like Windows and whatnot, if you've uh, launched Skype and you've shut the window, Skype is still totally running. So then you get all these lovely spam questions in the middle of your important presentation to your boss going, hey, you want a good time call? Not fun. And of course, as, as much as it's tending to move on, you know, folding at home or God knows what it is that you'd like to run in the background, it's really not cool to do that. Also, if you are going to be recording using something um, like Istanbul or what have you, is to pop him open and get him ready to go. Um, I know with Record My Desktop, um, it does a very handy thing. It just puts a little record button in the corner, but not until you launch it. So, good plan to do that. Make sense? Excellent. Any comments? I'm very appreciative of these comments, by the way. Yes? Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. What would this bring the beer thing? Then, yeah, I didn't talk about it too much, but yeah, if you can replicate the environment again that people would actually use, um, is a really important thing to do. So they're comfortable with it and familiar with it, and it runs in pretty much the same circumstances as it would on their own machine. I mean, you don't want to have people trying it out on an EPC going, oh, this is really small and fiddly, and I don't like it, and have you thinking that maybe there's something wrong with your interface. Well, no, it's probably just that they're not used to this teeny little screen. Make sense? Good times. Has anyone else got anything interesting to add? Anything at all? No? Oh! <laughs> so it'll be time to conduct the test at some point. How are we going for time? It's about 20 past. Now, it's time to actually conduct the test. Now, if they don't know you, of course, you should introduce yourself. It's really, really super important as well when you do the test to explain what the purpose is and to say, well, I just want to make sure that my app or my website or what have you works okay. Um, for anyone who is at the, uh, at the Linux Chicks thing on Monday, actually, we had a lot of discussions about people who would go, oh, I don't know how to use computers. They're really confronting. And when they break, people will call up in a tizzy going, it just said that it stack trace thing and they don't really understand what's going on. So um, when you have a thing that you're testing and they know that they're being observed doing that and there's anything that's slightly wrong, they start to freak out and think that it's a problem with them. Don't let that happen. Just make sure that you're explaining that you're not testing their skill necessarily, you're testing the application or the website. Make sense? Yep. Certainly do explain how it works. 
obviously, so you're just going to give them some things to do. You'd like to observe them doing it. You might want to take some notes or what have you as well, so do let them know that that's going on so they don't get all freaked out when you whip out your paper and pen. Um, try and explain how long it will take. It's better not to have it happen for three and a half hours, obviously, if you just want to test two things. So, you know, make sure that you're explaining how long that will go. It's super, super important to ask permission for recording. In Australia, if you're recording somebody without um, a really good reason and you haven't told them, then you are probably going to be in a bit of trouble, plus it's polite. Some people don't like being recorded at all, so you should offer to turn that off if they don't want it. For ethics, yeah. If you're just testing with a couple of mates, then you should certainly ask them and you maybe don't need it on paper. But if you find that that's an important thing for your project, like if you're getting funding from something, then yeah, you need to make sure that all your paperwork's up to date. Yeah. Yep. personally or how would a tester feel? To be honest, I'm not really a, a legal type of person. Um, I know that if, if your ISP is recording something that you are doing, which they do, of course, um, or at least logging things that is going on, and um, you'd like to tell people about that, then you should certainly feel free. The thing is that every ISP does this. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's in the terms and conditions of when you signed up for your internet service provider. So if you didn't already know that that's happening and you're upset about it, go and read it again. Hopefully, it's in the terms and conditions anyway. If it's not in the terms and conditions and they're doing it, then go and kick the bum. Um, but yeah, of course, you should ask permission for recording. Now, if you are doing something, I'll get right to you. If you are doing something that's fairly formal, then yes, as we've just heard, it's usually a good idea to get it in writing. Um, there are certain times when it is okay for you to record the person verbally saying, yes, I agree for this to happen. Yeah, you've got some sort of record of them saying that that's cool. Uh, as for, well... Honestly, I don't think I'd feel ethically unhappy if somebody recorded what I was doing on my desktop providing that I knew, but some people might get a bit perturbed by that. And I mean, if you're asking them to say test out, you know, a new browser skin or something like that, or, or a new web browser or what have you, and you just say, go and do your day-to-day -day sort of tasks, and they're not happy to re have that recorded, then of course that would be a bit naughty, because there could be something serious on there. Obviously, you shouldn't be encouraging people to go and log into their internet banking whilst you're recording. Yep. 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 For a hilarious fact about a certain banking institution in Australia, and you might ask which bank that is, um, it's a true fact that they actually do record every call, but they flag the ones where somebody says, no, I've never listened to this, and then they dispose of them at the end of the day. I'm not saying that that's a great idea for you to do, but I'm just saying it's, um, it's actually impossible to listen to one of those calls because it's flagged on the system somewhere, which is quite cool. But yeah, it is basically like that. So you should make sure that everybody knows exactly what's going on and of course you should tell them what it is you're going to do with it as well. Thank you. Now, finally, it's time to conduct the test. So you've set everything up, they're ready to sit down, you've given them the tasks, computer's switched on, they've got the mouse in their hand and everything's ready to go. During the test, for the love of God, stay calm. Please, please stay calm. You know how it is sometimes, you know, you get invited over for dinner to someone's house because they know you can fix a computer? Or they're like, I want to show you this awesome game that I got and they're spending half an hour trying to get the thing started and you just are so tempted to go for the love of God, give me the mouse. Obviously, you don't want to be able to do that in a test. That's really, very bad. Um, so try and stay calm. The other reason for staying calm as well is if they're not doing something that you think is incredibly obvious and you're sitting there going, oh my God, like that, they're going to pick up on that. And it's, just, it's not right. It's just going to affect all the results and it's going to make them unhappy and make you look like a dick. So don't do it. 
Watching the screen and the test was obviously very important as well, certainly if you're not recording or you don't have any click uh, metrics or anything going on there as well. Do keep an eye on what they're doing, but also have a look at them because you'll have people who, you know, they'll be doing something and, you know, you might think that they're going through it okay, but they're looking like this. So for the benefit of the recording, I'm making a face. <laughs> We're looking like this. You can actually pick up quite a lot from people's facial expressions if, if you're attuned to people's facial expressions. Um, even if you're not, of course, you should be encouraging people while the test goes on. So we'll talk me through what you're doing. So they can say, oh, I don't know really where to look. Um, I might kill it. No, I don't think it's there and so on. And they can talk themselves through the thing. Now, this can be quite a difficult thing to encourage people to do. But if you can get people to speak up about what they're doing, it can be quite useful as well. Do listen carefully to what they're saying, obviously. Um, if you would like people to say these things, I've got a couple of you know, hilarious prompts up there, so what are you thinking about whilst you're looking at this, or if they get stuck or what have you, I'll get right to you. Um, or you know, you can even be, not necessarily terribly encouraging, but at least sort of say to them, well, you seem to be fairly comfortable with what you're doing right now, and then it sort of prompts them to, to say, well, yeah, actually, I find that this bit's really easy to use. Up the back, sir. Mm -hmm. It can do, yeah, but the thing is, until we discover telepathy, it's not going to help for us. So. Mm. As long as they're feeling comfy and relaxed, they're not going to say, oh my God, I better not say that thing out loud because they'll think I'm an idiot or what have you. But if you just sort of say, well, you know, what sort of thought process is or where do you think this might be or what have you. It'll, I mean, those sorts of questions hopefully will come fairly naturally to you. If you have a project in mind and you're watching them do something and you know that they're in a particular point or, you know, you might want to, um, you might want to just, just ask them to say, well, what, what step do you think you might want to take next? or something, which might seem like it's prompting them to do something more, but it also encourages them to say, I think I might do blah. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's geez, even in education things like that, it's the sort of tool that's been used for ages, and it's, while it might seem like it's skewing the data somewhat, it's still really useful. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it's important to remember this is, this is I, I don't like the word soft science, but it is qualitative. It's not, you know, hard statistics and, yeah. This is true, yeah. Yeah. Now, it's important to remember, um, try not to give anything away. So if somebody says, I can't find this thing, what do I do? Just encourage them maybe to try for themselves. But, of course, if they're really stuck, do just let them know that it's okay to stop and that they don't have to, you know, try and push it uphill, so to speak. Make sense? Gosh, I hope so. Obviously, of course, you should take some notes about, you know, what it is that they found easy and hard or what have you. Um, what did they successfully get around to and what they didn't? Um, did they have to try and resort to asking or using help? if the test involves using the help system, of course, um, what sort of things. And also try and take notes of the emotional things that they were going through. So again, if they are saying, oh, shit, uh, uh, what, you know, and stuff like that, try and take a note of that. Um, you don't have to actually write it down precisely as a transcript. Subject said shit, 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 but you can say they are clearly quite frustrated with task B or what have you. And of course, finally, evaluating the results. Now, it is fairly obvious once you actually see some results um, of something to say, well, I reckon that since they have a problem using such and such widget, um, then they might have some tricky situations there. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, if you want to get all checkboxy, yeah. No, well, I mean, if you're recording, you certainly don't have to write down every single word again. But, um, but yeah, I mean, just some general notes or smiley faces, what have you, is great. Yes? And if you're writing your uh, test subjects, if you're sitting there writing and taking notes, they'll be, they'll be, they'll be, you're distracting them and they're... Yeah, that's right. And there's nothing worse than if someone says, oh, I've done this bit, I'm ready to go on, and you say, no, I have to finish writing the sentence. That's, no, don't do that. Um, sorry, hang on. Terry, did you have your hand up? We're just scratching your head. Okay, sorry. And if you want to see how not to do it, see the interview uh, with John Cleese and Tim Brooke Taylor. 
<laughs> yes. There's there's so much wisdom to be gained from British comedy. Yes. <laughs> Yep, you can always take notes later. Yep. Yep. There's absolutely. Yeah, there's no need to take notes if you're recording absolutely everything. Um, yeah, exactly. If you pick up on something that isn't going to be able to be recorded, obviously, if you don't have a webcam or something, if it's a facial expression, then yeah, of course you should. But if you've got absolutely everything covered already, that's great. That's right. So yeah, for anyone who didn't catch that, a, uh, a few questions that are kind of like at scaleish in, in nature, or you know, did you like this, or even just some sort of you know um, freeform feedback. So what did you like about this, or um, which is a little less easy to get, um, but that way you've got some some actual numbers in there to say, well, on a scale of one to eight or one to five, what have you, I rate this a two, for example. Make sense? So you can certainly add those. And yeah, you're right. I didn't add those, and it was quite an oversight. But yeah, certainly asking for their comments about anything else that they'd like to add is great because even if they say, oh, you know, I don't like the colour scheme or that button is really ugly or what have you, can be um, useful things as well. Now, there's quite a lot more reading. There are lots of great books and uh, certainly you should feel free to do some research on that. Um, Jacob Nielsen has published a couple, quite a few, or a couple. Um, there are a few good websites there. If you're doing um, normal KDE sort of related development, then obviously there's the two usability bits and pieces there. Um, Useit.com. Uh, I'm a bit of a beef with Jacob because he's quite an awful writer. I actually find his writing style is, is I don't like it. Um, but there's full of interesting facts and figures that he's learned from many, many, many studies that he's done, and he does tend to put things very clearly, if a little dry. Um, there's the openusability.org thing going on there as well, though I'm not sure how um, active that is at the moment. Is anyone part of that here? Nope. Perhaps you'd like to be. Does anyone have anything that they'd like to discuss in the How much time do we have left, sir? Three minutes. We have three minutes for questions starting up the back and moving quite along. Yeah. Yep, so again, yeah, for the benefit of the recording, absolutely yes. If you're at a conference or something where people will be around and they can just have a fiddle with it, just step back and watch them do it because, oh yeah, any opportunity you can get to watch people use it in a fairly natural environment is great. Um, Pascal, did you have your hand up before? Yeah, just on my side Oh, fantastic. Yep, yep, that can be quite good as well. So yeah, um, betterdesktop.org. Yeah, oh, that sounds quite cool, yeah. Did anyone else have anything to... Alan Cooper. Alan Cooper. <laughs> fantastic. Wonderful. Don't make me think is a cracker of a book, isn't it? It's great, and it's a fast read, and yeah, and it's an easy read. Mhm. Mm yep. Yeah, designing everyday things is great. I mean, even just things like taps and what have you was. Sorry, I'm going this way across the room. So. <laughs> If it's something that you want them to notice and they don't see it and you have to draw your, their attention to it, that's an answer in itself. If you'd like them to point out it anyway, if, if that's part of the task and it's really important to you, then yeah, you can certainly say, can I get you to try this out for me or something like that. We've got not many minutes, let's, let's be quick. No? Up the back? 
Yep. Um, that's fine. Look, there's still aspects of, I mean, everything that requires you typing things in and getting feedback is an interface with an interaction, yeah? So if you can record those sorts of things in, yeah, you don't have things to click on and pretty colours and what have you, but obviously things like the, the form that, um, that feedback takes or the prompts or how many steps it takes to do something that you could probably script a little easier are things that you can learn about a command line interface, yep. Being really quick, sorry, I can see that you've been hanging off the, can I, sorry, I'll just jump over to you because you've been hanging off the stairs now for... Yes. Yeah, if you've um if you've got something that they can't grok, tough. Yeah, you really need to fix that. No, absolutely right. Uh huh. Yep. Yes. What does this look like to you? And yeah. Yeah, if you're not a fan of paper, you can actually model that stuff quite nicely with um, open office presentation tools because you can attach little clicky events to things as well. So you can dummy up a very nice interface and say, first of all, what do you think this is for? And then say, what am I going to click on? Uh, yep, you can print them out, circle them. Yep, you can even if you like, um, this is something that quite often happens in web development is, um, is do a thing called card sorting, where what you do is you get some topics and some concepts and you say, well, how would you arrange those? You just give them to them in a big mess and say, just arrange them in a way that makes sense for me. So you can get some really interesting uh, feedback from there about how they might do something without you having to tell them to point at it or, or what have you. Um, we're quite short on time. Anything else? One last one over there, or are you just sort of stretching? Just stretching? Was a good stretch? Fantastic. All right, well, we're ready to finish up. So thanks so much for coming along.